I am currently a postdoc at Novartis in Cambridge, Central Square, and I work in the Department of Immuno-Oncology, and what we're focused on is really trying to figure out a less bad way, a less toxic way to treat cancer, uh, different types of cancer, and some of you may be familiar with a few of the more conventional methods, like chemotherapy or radiation therapy, those are some buzzwords that are that are in the field for, for cancer treatment. But we, we at Novartis now are really pursuing this new field that's called cancer immunotherapy. And what this tr new approach to dealing with cancer is all about is really helping your immune system work better, kind of work with your body, with your physiology, to kill cancer uh, cells. And I'll explain much more in detail as, as we go through this. It'll hopefully make so cancer is a pretty serious global problem. Uh, as of 2014, there were about 14 million cases worldwide, and the cases keep growing as the global population ages, which it's doing, especially in the developed world, in the US, in Canada, in Japan, in uh, other regions of the Pacific Rim. Uh, and it's a very expensive problem to deal with as well. So it's about $1.6 trillion uh, in 2014 to treat different cancer cases. And this little cartoon here really illustrates that it is a global problem. So as you go from this yellow square here to red, that's the severity of the uh, cancer problems that are going on in the world. So it is really a global issue and we're working hard to tackle it, but as you'll see, it's a very complex disease, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Uh, so cancer, there isn't just one type of cancer. There's a whole array. It's a, it's a really diverse kind of disease. Um, cancer can affect pretty much any tissue in the body. Um, and depending on what kind of cancer a patient has, you can be more or less successful at curing it or treating it or keeping it at bay. Uh, so pancreatic cancer, for example, cancer of the pancreas, is a very problematic uh, case. Um, from the time of diagnosis, within a five-year span, about 93% of patients die. Uh, prostate cancer, for example, on the other hand, it's a very, you have a very good prognosis. So there's this whole kind of array here. Uh, this cartoon here uh, depicts the prevalence of cancer in the U.S. So, uh, most common cancers by, occur by occurrence in males and females is over here on the left. And the percentage of, people's of people diagnosed with these different cancers that die is over here on the right. Just to kind of reiterate the uh, cartoon I showed in the previous slide. So cancer can be caused by many different uh, underlying agents. Uh, it can be induced chemically. So for example, people that smoke cigarettes or any sort of tobacco products, they have a high rate of lung cancer. Um, people who have poor diet or poor exercise or have different metabolic um, issues like for example, diabetes, they can also develop cancer, they're at, they're at a greater risk. People that are uh, contracting different uh, viral infections like hepatitis or some sexually transmitted uh, viruses can also uh, get cancer as a result. Exposure to radiation is another uh, underlying cause and heredity, which is genetics that you get from your parents. So these are the main types of uh, causes of cancer. Okay, so cancer, it's in the news a lot today, and people tend to think of it as a relatively new problem, but it's really not. Uh, it's a very ancient issue that humanity has been grappling with since people have been recording history, in a sense. Uh, the ancient Egyptian, Egyptians, the uh, ancient Egyptian physicians, this is a papyrus here uh, on the left, documenting cases of cancer, different tumors that Egyptian physicians were observing in patients different 
growths that they found either on the neck or in the abdomen. Uh, they were very perplexed by these different abnormal growths. Uh, they were either benign or they were or metastatic, um, and they didn't know how to deal with it. And in this, what's translated here from ancient Egyptian and Greek into English is there is no treatment. They didn't know what to do. And that kind of followed along for a very long time, from Egypt to Persia to Greece to the Byzantine Empire. Uh, people were really baffled uh, by, by what this is and what's going on. People thought it could be an imbalance of the humors in the body, like the different chemicals in the body, maybe that's what's happening. They didn't really know. Um, and then, coming up to more modern times, in the 17th century, I believe. So this is a cartoon from a, uh, a physician in the 17th century in the Netherlands, where they started to use surgery to extract these uh, different tumors. So this is a woman with a very large growth on her neck, a cancerous growth, and kind of representing how you can maybe not cure, but keep the disease from progressing rapidly by extracting that tumor. So, as the population has aged, cancer has become more prevalent. And I'll explain why a little bit later on. Um, cancer, it, is, it seems to be more an accumulation of different insults to the body, to the DNA, to the genetics that accumulate over a person's lifespan. And there's been this sort of big push in the last few decades to really try to find a cure for cancer. And one of the first prominent politicians to start to really push for greater attention to cancer was uh, Richard Nixon. He made, I'll just play a short clip of this statement that he gave to Congress trying to dedicate more money to dedicate to cancer research. And that was in 1971. The same kind of concentrated effort that split the atom and took man to the moon, should be turned toward conquering this dread disease. President Nixon signed into law today the bill committing more than one and a half billion dollars to a war on cancer. The three-year program involves research, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment. We may look back on this as being the most significant action taken during this administration. The message seemed clear. With enough resolve, the United States could easily defeat one of its deadliest enemies. Cancer. Never has the situation been quite so ready to pop with different weeds. There were some predicting the cancer would be solved by the bicentennial in 1976. But it was only a few years before the questions began. The American Cancer Society has responded to recent criticism that the federally funded war against cancer has been wasteful and ineffective. There is little tangible to show for the money that has been spent. Did the war on cancer promise too much too soon? And more than 40 years later, where has the progress against cancer really been made? Yeah, so that was in 1971. There was this really sort of emotional, idealistic optimism that we were going to spend a whole bunch of money and cure this disease. And rightly so, it was a lot of money. Clearly, we have not cured cancer. Uh, we have made progress, but I just wanted to play that as a clip to kind of show where we were just a few short decades ago and compare that to actually another similar event that happened a couple weeks ago at one of the world's largest cancer conference that was in New Orleans, uh, the American Association for Cancer Research, AACR. And Joe Biden came and gave a very similar speech to Nixon in which he also, also pledged a billion dollars to cure cancer. Um, so we keep making these um, really impactful statements and we're really hopeful, but we haven't cured cancer. Uh, why is that? So let's start first with trying to define what cancer is. And I say try because there's no real clear-cut explanation for how cancer causes disease. We know how it arises, but how does it kill a person? How does it make a person sick? If you ask a physician, if you ask a PhD researcher, there's, there's no real clear explanation. Jim and I actually over dinner just now were discussing this very question. 
Um, but we can offer maybe some glimpses into what's going on and some windows uh, into the future for uh, contributing to the advance of medicine, making humanity a little more tolerable going forward. So cancer, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Cancer is a cellular disease. And New cells are formed. Healthy cells, they, they divide. So they oftentimes they'll, they'll split into two, two daughter cells will split into four cells, four into eight, etc. But healthy cells and healthy tissue from a healthy person, they have this mechanism that tells them to stop dividing at a certain point. They say you have enough cells to make a tissue, to make an organ, for example, like a heart, or like a liver. Stop there, don't keep going. What happens with cancer is there's no off mechanism for a cell to divide. They just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. So division looks like cell division, something like this. One cell splits to become two cells. Cell division involves So these are healthy cells. cells. They divide and, the and then they kind of stop for a little division, bit. The nucleus divides. In the second process, cytokinesis, the cytoplasm divides, producing two cells. Yeah, okay, so that's what happens in a healthy person. This cartoon illustrates what happens when somebody develops cancer. You have uncontrolled cell division, and you get these masses of accumulating cells that form like tissues that bodge themselves either in your abdomen or in your neck or in your brain or wherever. And uh, it causes a problem. It sucks nutrients away from your bloodstream. It starts to deform organs, and that can cause a lot of disease death. The underlying molecular mechanism for cancer starts with your DNA. So DNA, as I'm sure some of you are aware, it codes for information that drives our behavior. So DNA makes um, proteins, which cells use to function. So when you have different environmental or chemical or hereditary insults to your DNA that kind of lodge, your, lodge themselves in the DNA strands, you get accumulating mutations. And these mutations in the DNA, they can actually oftentimes change in such a way to make your cells uh, keep dividing. So that off switch that normal healthy cells have uh, to tell a cell to stop dividing, mutations that damage your DNA, they can eliminate that off switch. So the cells keep dividing and dividing. So it starts with DNA and changes to the DNA code, in essence. Have they had any luck with gene therapy? There are some, yeah. Um, unfortunately, not a whole lot. DNA, yeah, DNA therapy is a very broad field. There are some very cutting edge new advancements in gene therapy that, I mean, I can elaborate on if you're, if you're interested. Yeah. Um, so there's this new technology, it's called CRISPR. Uh, I forget exactly what it stands for, but what this technology does is um, you can go in to your DNA, and if there's a mutation, an abnormal deviation in your DNA sequence, this CRISPR mechanism, it can come in and it, it can delete that mutation in your DNA. And it can try to restore the original healthy sequence. And it has worked in some cases. It's called CRISPR. There are whole companies that, that have been founded recently on this, on this principle. And people are very hopeful about this particular type of gene therapy. Another type of gene therapy, which I'll actually talk about at the very end, but that I can mention, mention briefly now, is people have developed these synthetic molecules that they express, that they artificially implant in cells. And these synthetic molecules are designed to specifically target uh, other molecules that are, that are on cancerous cells and only target those cancer markers, basically. It's like a little flag on a tumor saying, I'm, I'm a bad cell, I'm a tumor. And these uh, synthetic molecules that are implanted actually in immune cells. They specifically bind to those bad red flags and kill those tumors, leaving the rest of the body untouched. 
So that's another avenue of gene therapy that people are pursuing, and that's also showing very promising preliminary results in phase one clinical trials. Actually, it's the company I'm at is involved in some of that research as well. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. I knew it existed. I just didn't know to what extent or how, how well they were doing with it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's a very exciting time in gene therapy. Any other questions? Feel free to interrupt. Is everything making sense? Straightforward? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so DNA, that's the fundamental basis for how cancer arises. DNA changes in a bad way. There's a mutation that takes away the off switch and the cells proliferate like crazy. And you get these tumors, and the tumors can actually move around in your body. They can migrate around. Say you have a cancer in your uh, liver, for example. The cells, tumor cells from the liver, they can migrate, or they can metastasize. It's called metastasis. It can go to your brain or to your pancreas or whatever. Um, and they, because of this lack of an off switch, because of the DNA mutation, they start proliferating their liver. Okay, so to give you a little bit of a backstory, originally when people started to grapple with cancer, these were the conventional therapies. Surgery, like I mentioned, which started around 1660 in the Netherlands, uh, and radiation therapy. So Marie Curie in France, she discovered uh, radon, they started to apply radiation therapy to cancer and things like that. And also, people caught on very quickly that the earlier you catch, any abnormal growths, the easier it is to deal with the problem, either to excise the tumor, to cut it out, or to apply radiation therapy to the tumor. There are other treatments. Uh, I'll just summarize some of them quickly here. So chemotherapy, which is different than radiation therapy, uh, was developed by a native Bostonian, Sidney Farber. So the Dana Farber in Boston, the Farber Park, is in tribute to this man here who, uh, he was, actually he wasn't Bostonian, he was from New York, but he moved to Boston at an early age. He did his residency at Brigham and Women's, and he stayed at Children's Hospital until the end of his career. He developed chemotherapy, the administration of chemical substances that target um, quickly dividing cells, abnormal growths, um, by administering poisons, basically, to target these, these uh, malignant growths. Uh, there are a lot of off-target effects to chemotherapy, which is why it's not really the best approach in a lot of people's opinion. Um, you have immunosuppression, digestive distress, hair loss, really not things you want to live with. They make life quite miserable. Radiation therapy I mentioned briefly, so high levels of radiation, obviously a patient kind of lies on this table here. Radiation targets the whole body. It's also not a very specific type of therapy. You get a lot of off-target, non-specific, um, uh, non-specific uh, physiological problems, heart failure, uh, cognitive decline. It can also cause cancer itself in many cases, liver damage and fertility. But it is a commonly used approach. It can help certain pa patients depend depending on their uh, prognosis. Surgery, obviously, is a very commonly used approach. It's one of the better known uh, therapies for treating cancer. Uh, one I haven't touched upon yet is bone marrow transplantation. And bone marrow transplantation is an interesting one. It particularly is useful in uh, cancers of the blood. So for example, leukemias, lymphomas, it's, it, it can be particularly efficacious, and I'll explain why in uh, just a second. Um, I'll just explain in a little bit here what uh, bone marrow transplantation is. Basically what happens when a per candidate is identified for bone marrow transplants is the uh, region of the body that's afflicted with the cancer is irradiated, or you have total whole body irradiation, like I showed in the previous slide, with patient kind of just lies there on a board and gets irradiated. And then basically you have hematopoietic stem cells, which are these cells that are hanging out in the bone marrow. Um, there, a lot of them are precursors, precursors to immune cells. So 
cancers of the blood, a lot of them target immune cells. So you have uncontrolled growth of white blood cells, cells of the immune system. And so when you irradiate uh, a person, you're kind of just killing off those cells in the body, and you're injecting in fresh, healthy cells from a donor. And the idea here is that these injected new hematopoietic cells will eventually become new, healthy immune cells, and they'll repopulate the bloodstream. So they're, you're replacing, you're reinfusing healthy cells, replacing the cancer cells, and hopefully that will be that. Um, does that make sense, that technique? Yeah? Yeah. Um, to help advance this method as a viable treatment for many different patients with leukemia, uh, the U.S. has established this I mean, national marrow don donor program. Um, and the reason they have this consortium is because the odds of two random individuals that have the, are the correct match for one another uh, is one in 20,000. So donors and recipients, they have to match one another. And I won't go into the molecular mechanism for that. But I'm sure some of you have heard of people, when they get a transplant of an organ, the body can reject that organ. And that's because the um, donor and recipient immune systems often are not compatible with one another. So there's an actual immune response in which either the host or the donor tissue will start attacking each other, causing a lot of damage to the person. So this consortium, what it does is to minimize these incredible odds of finding compatible matches, they have this repository, it's like a computerized library. Well, let's type in a name, and they have all the molecular information for the different donors and recipients. And very quickly, they can say, oh, there's a match in Denver. There's a guy here who needs uh, uh, an infusion of these hematopoietic stem cells in New York or in Boston. And boom, it's done. You've got a question. But, oh, you have a question? Yeah. 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 Do those hemat hematopoietic stem cells need those HLAs on them, or can we just chop them off? Is there any way of doing that? Chopping off HLA, ah, uh, that's pretty tricky. So we need HLAs because, so HLAs, to give a very general explanation, HLAs are a type of molecule that are expressed not only on immune cells, but on a lot of different tissues in our body. And they present different, um, peptides, or mo molecules which are called peptides, which tell the immune system, I am part of your body, don't attack me, or I'm presenting something foreign, do attack me. So if you get rid of an HLA, you run the risk of, or if you have a mismatched HLA, you run the risk of either getting immunodeficiency because your host, your, your own immune system can't recognize the foreign pathogen, like a virus or bacteria, that's being presented on the surface of the cell, or your immune system recognizes the HLA as foreign and starts attacking it. So it, it's very complicated. Does that make sense? This is also something that we covered in the first lecture. So HLA is the same thing as MHC in humans. Oh, so you, at least. Okay, you covered this. Okay. Just briefly, we okay. talked about how MK cells will attack cells that don't have MHC. I'm okay. probably jumping from topic to topic. If you can genetically engineer things to knock out, you know, the cancer gene, mm -hmm. could you genetically engineer those kinds of cells to knock out or replace HLAs for people that... I see. That's a good question. Or put the ones that that person needs. Right. You know, so right, once you right, figure right. it out, you could just, like, match them up. That's a good question. I'm not aware of the, everyone trying that, but I don't. And also, don't know why people haven't tried that. Jim, do you or Liz? Not a clue. I mean, um, theoretically, it should work. I suppose you'd need to know a lot of information because it's mo also more than just right. There's probably a HLA. series of different things. It's yeah. not just one gene; it's a whole set of. Genes. There's so many different yeah. classes of HLAs, um, and that's why the odds are so small. Like siblings or like identical twins would have the same HLA, but um, random people. It's like a whole mishmash. So maybe you could genetically engineer it, but again, you have to have the HLA, otherwise the immune system won't function properly. It would either attack 
You can probably both attack yeah. your body. Yeah, either you Because all of your cells have, you can't get rid of the HLA on mm -hmm. your And there's cell. also more to, to matching than HLA. So you'd need the entire HLA locus, because it's not just one gene, it's a whole locus. Exactly. And then also the minor histocompatibility the loci. Yeah, and like Liz was saying, you could either get a lot of really bad immunodeficiency, you would be sick all the time, or autoimmunity and inflammation and damage to your body that way. Yeah, people might be working on it, but it's actually, like that kind of genetic manipulation, we're not quite, to my knowledge, we're not quite there yet. And then there's ethical concerns. For well, weapons. and actually, in transplant biology, one of the main reasons people uh, are on really strong immunosuppressants is because of this issue of HLA mismatch. Um, you know, like you, you bought the immune system will start attacking the tissue. That, at that point, you can't really do anything ra rather other than just shutting down, the, not shutting down, but really dampening the immune system overall, and that causes immunodeficiency. So people are really susceptible to viral and bacterial infections that we normal, healthy people are not. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting concept to think about. Go sell it to Novartis. Yeah, I'll go, <laughs> I'll go right now. So one of the reasons, uh, one of the issues with uh, bone marrow transplants is actually this off-target sort of autoimmune disease that arises. It's called graft versus host disease, and it means exactly what you would think. So the graft, so the infused, for example, hematopoietic cells or the bone marrow that's being introduced into the recipient patient, um, it starts to fight with the host's immune response. And you get these really bad symptoms. So you'll get skin lesions, you'll get inflammation of the, of the digestive tract. This is the uh, small bowel from a patient, for example. Uh, this is a very advanced case of graft versus host disease after a small child had uh, received a bone marrow transplant. Um, this is an acute phase, so this is not a long-lasting um, effect of the bone marrow transplant. There are chronic cases as well, illustrated here. You get deformities of the joints, of the, of the bones, like things you see with um, people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, their hands, their joints are kind of disfigured. Um, you get a lot of like oral sort of disfigurement or infections, inflammation in the, in the lungs and the, in the bowel all over the body. So it's also not the best treatment for treating cancer, either solid tumors or cancers of the blood. Which brings us to uh, sort of the new hot field in cancer therapy, which is immunotherapy, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, there are three main questions that I'll briefly go over. What is immunotherapy? Why is it interesting? Why are researchers really excited about it? And how does it work? So immunotherapy, in most general terms, is it's a type of biological therapy that enables your own, uh, the host immune system, to work with your body to fight off cancer. And of all the cancer therapies, this is probably one of the newest comers to the scene. So if you look at this timeline, some of the more relevant dates are the late 90s and the earlier part of this decade where a lot of clinical trials have started centering around this idea of immunotherapy. Okay, so why is immunotherapy interesting? Yeah? Is this what they use to um, control AIDS, immunotherapy? I mean, what, 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 they've been so successful with AIDS, I can't see why they can't do anything with cancer. AIDS came out of the woodwork 20 or 30 years ago. Cancer's been here forever. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet they target uh, AIDS and bang, they get it under control. Yeah, you know, that's Explain a good question. to me <laughs> what, how it, that's a possibility. It, I can't understand it. When they found controlling AIDS, uh, getting it under control, curing it or whatever, I felt that, oh wow, this is opening the door for a cure to cancer. There's no question in my mind. Yeah. And to be honest, I'm not as well read on AIDS, um, the current treatment for AIDS. I don't so know. I could maybe 
helmet. So yeah, with yeah. AIDS, they're trying to target a specific virus. And so the treatment isn't really, so even, so the AIDS virus infects the T cells, right? But, and it kills them, so you become immune deficient. Yeah. But um, what the treatments do is they're targeting the one virus. And they, they know in general how the virus works. It does mutate a lot, but its general mechanisms are pretty uniform. It has a, a life cycle that we know, and so they can hit it at different parts of its life cycle and usually keep it under control. The problem with cancer is it's all different cells, it's all different mutations that have all different proteins. So like everyone is different, so it's much harder to sort of, first of all, pinpoint the actual problem and then develop a single therapy that would take care of it. So for some, like you mentioned, they have it better under control, but for others, it's harder. And I think it's just because of the diversity <coughs> of the um, actual disease mechanism that makes it a more difficult problem. So are they targeting the immune system to keep AIDS under control? Are they using <coughs> Not uh, immune boosting drugs? Uh, so only recently. Only recently. So yeah. initially the treatments were all trying to keep the virus from replicating, mm -hmm. like the highly active antiretroviral anti yeah. therapies were to keep the virus from replicating. Mm -hmm. But now people are finding that there's still a problem once you suppress the virus. It's still there. You have to get rid of it. It's so they're trying sure. to manipulate the immune system, turn it back on by using very similar things that, that you use for cancer. Right. Uh, that's a good... Yeah. You guys we got your back. <laughs> yeah. Does that help? Yeah. I yeah. was just curious. I mean, yeah. I think the average person is left in awe of how successful they've been with a disease that was taking people down, you know, as bad as cancer was in a way. And then all of a sudden, boom, we could do this with that, but we can't cure cancer, we can't control it. It didn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. And yeah, definitely something to think about. Um, yeah, so, okay, so what is immunotherapy? Why are we interested in this particular uh, treatment? Uh, so cells of the immune system, particularly these T cells, which are one of the very, they're a very important component of the, of the body's immune response. They have this unique property in which they can remember different um, pathogens that they've encountered in the past. So if you've ever been sick with a virus or a bacteria, um, if you re-encounter that same pathogen, for example, anyone who's got chicken pox, um, when you're re-exposed to that same virus or bacteria, your immune system is reinitiated very quickly because it's seen it before. It knows what it is. So scientists are hoping to use that same unique property of the immune system and apply that to, to cancer. Um, the other thing people are noticing with cancer, with immunotherapy, is that responses against tumorous cells by the immune system, they can be maintained long after a treatment is, is completed. Um, so instances of relapse and recurring sort of episodes with cancer, with the same type of cancer, or even um, metastasis and cancer arising in different parts of the body. With cancer immunotherapy, there isn't really that much of that going on. Uh, and there's minimal toxicity. So the off-target effects I mentioned with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and even uh, bone, mar bone marrow transplantation um, in the preliminary um, clinical trials, there's very little uh, off-target uh, toxicity that's going on with these patients. So it seems very promising. Like I said, T cells are the main focus of immunotherapy, at least for right now. It's definitely going to expand down the road. Another question on the immune system. It seems like elderly people, their immune system starts to fail at a certain age. Mm -hmm. Not always old people, but I mean, I'm sure young people also. But I think age has a lot to do with it. Yes. So why can't they pick up on this, how the immune system retracts in, at age and try to replace whatever keeps the immune system healthy as a young person? Because to, to me, I honestly believe any yeah. of us and all of us either have cancer in us and it's suppressed by our immune system. It is, it, it, it absolutely is. And then our immune system starts to fail and the cancer takes over. That's a very good point. So we do have cancer cells all the time. Every healthy person, 
at some point, at some point in his or her life, most likely will have a few tumor cancerous cells somewhere in their body. And the immune system does a very good job, like you said, especially in young people, at finding those cancerous cells and killing them or suppressing their growth. The issue of age is actually attracting a lot of attention in immunology right now. And people are, there are a lot of groups working on this issue. What is the underlying genetic or environmental or molecular uh, cause of immune decline during age? And there's some potential explanations. Um, so vitamins can have a lot to do with it. Um, I know that one of the key organs in which T cells actually mature and form, it's called the thymus. I know that over time, that organ in people, it shrinks. And the argument has been, I don't know if this is entirely true, but the argument that the, the guess has been that as that organ shrinks, you get less of these T cells in your body. So the fewer cells you have, the less number you have to patrol all of your organs for infection. That's one possibility. The other possibility has to do, like I said, with vitamins. Like maybe um, older people don't have the right, the right balance in vitamins. And studies have, been sh have shown that a vitamin imbalance, like in the bloodstream or in tissues, can alter the ability of these T cells, for example, to scan the body for different infections. And if you supplement um, a, a, a soup in which T cells grow, like in a tissue culture lab, those that function, the vitality of those immune cells can be restored. So that's another possibility, is vitamin supplementation. Um, those are the two that I'm the most familiar with, with regards to why the immune system declines. Shrinkage of that vital organ, the thymus, and vitamins. I don't know if you guys or anyone else has any other... There's not a great answer yet, but there's only yeah. a lot of money being poured into there's it. There's a lot of money being poured into it. Because all the representatives yeah. that fund these things are aging people. Yeah. So they care about it. Sure, uh, the aging population is definitely <laughs> forcing us to read. See the old geezers. I meant you. Okay, so yeah, so T cells, yeah, these are very important cells of the immune system. They kill cells that are infected with different viruses, with different bacteria that we pick up from a cut or from putting our hand in our mouth or whatever the case may be. Um, and like I said, they retain memory to previously encountered bad guys, viruses, bacteria. So you're not sick with the same uh, disease too often, unless you're immunocompromised. That's a whole different can of worms. So, this is a cool video that I found of T cells actually killing cancerous cells. And I can pause it if things aren't making sense and I'll try to explain what's going on here. Inside all of us lurks a serial killer. So the green guy is the T cell, these red guys or blue guys are the cancerous cells. Then kill cells. again. These are cytotoxic T cells, green guys. a specialized member of our white blood cells. They patrol our bodies, identifying and destroying virally infected and cancer cells. And they do so with remarkable precision and efficiency. There are about 5 million T cells in a teaspoon of our blood, engaged in the ferocious and unrelenting battle to keep us healthy. These amorphous blobs move around quite rapidly, pushing out their leading edge Probing so they're very mobile, like they move around, and that's how they scan our entire body. The they're very T agile. Cell finds a cancer cell. Membrane protrusions so the cancer cell? explore the surface of the cell, checking for the telltale signs of cancer. They kill their targets using poisonous proteins visible here in red. These cytotoxic granules move down special pathways in the cell called microtubules the interface between the T-cell and the cancer cell. The T-cell punctures the surface of the cancer cell and delivers its deadly cytotoxin. 
So does that make sense? Those little red guys, the T cell will actually eject those little red molecules. They're called perforins. They're ejected, basically. They're expelled from the T cell. And those red little guys, they will puncture holes in the cancer cells. And puncturing holes in the cell is very bad. It often causes cells to die. So this is a really elegant mechanism in which the T cell can kill a cancer cell. It recognizes the cancer cell, ejects those little red proteins, perforins, punch those perforins punch holes in the target cell, the cancer cell, and the cancers die. And, that, and that's, that's one of the mechanisms by which we're thinking the immune system is helping keep cancer at bay, especially in healthy young people. Do they have a way of telling how, how much how many healthy cells you have to, how many T cells you have? I mean, it, as they decline, is there a way of telling they decline? Is there, there a is. Test or? Yeah, so there's, it definitely comes up in like a, a routine blood test, mm -hmm. but it doesn't come up specifically, maybe, no, there is a way to look for specifically for T cells, look, but oftentimes when you go for an annual, annual checkup, mm -hmm. um, on your blood test, it'll come up as white blood cell count. If it's very high, that's often indicative that you have some sort of infection. Maybe you have a fever, maybe you're battling with the flu or something. <coughs> uh, if it's low, you could be immunocompromised. You may have some sort of uh, genetic disorder uh, in which you're not making as many white blood cells. In, in many, especially childhood immunodeficiencies, the first telltale, child, telltale sign that a, uh, a kid is immunocompromised is to look at the blood test and say, oh, your white blood cell count is very low, or your T cell count is very low. So they, they definitely monitor it. And you say that by vitamins can boost this T cell? Not numbers, but they can boost the function, so yeah. their ability to kill things. They make them more healthy? Yep, yep. That's one of the explanations for, um, for, how, for why T cells can, or the immune system can lose its efficacy over time. It's not entirely clear if that's the only way. It's probably not the only reason why our immune so uh, system starts failing as we age, but it certainly can be one, one uh, chunk piece of the puzzle. Could as a dis up and figure it out, will you? <laughs> huh? Hurry up and figure it out. <laughs> as a disclaimer as well, there's a lot of food that you can put on a label that says boosts immunity or something like that. Most of that is absolute garbage that's not oh, regulated by the FDA. There is absolutely solid evidence that says that the right nutritional balance affects immunity, but yeah. to say that you can put twice as much vitamin A or something in your bread is No, that's gonna, probably bad. Yeah. Yeah. So it, just be careful when you see something. Be skeptical when you see something like that on food or something. Yeah. Just eat more broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> This is very important in our bodies, where cells are packed together, as it focuses the lethal hit on the target and minimizes collateral damage to the neighboring That's the cancer cells. cell that these T cells are attacking. The fate of the cancer cell is sealed. The T cell then moves on, hungry to find another victim. As you saw, those T cells, they, they're very agile. They move around. They're not stationary. They, they don't stick to one place. So in that way, your immune system works to keep your entire body healthy. If you have an infection, if you cut yourself on your hand, the immune system has this way, mechanism for recruiting other immune cells to that site of the cut and prevent an infection from occurring. The same principle can be applied to cancer as well. So, T cells can be turned on and off, as I mentioned. I won't go into the specifics of this, but if they're, turn, if they're on all the time, obviously that's bad, as we talked about. You can get autoimmunity. Your immune system can start attacking itself. So it's important to usually keep it on, uh, keep it off, and turn it on when you have an infection or when you have cancer. So turn a T cell on. Uh, the T cell, it has this molecule, this protein, it's called a T cell receptor. And that's the, one of the important, probably the most important component of the T cell. 
for finding bad things in your body. So when a T cell receptor binds to an MHC or HLA gene, uh, if it recognizes it as a bad thing, the T cell will be turned on. And you'll mount an immune response. The cells will start uh, proliferating, dividing. You might get swollen lymph nodes, like under your, on your neck or under your armpits. They can start to hurt. Um, it can be because your immune system is actually ramping up. And the T cells are a part of that. They start getting activated, they proliferate, and they produce these molecules. They're called cytokines which uh, also aid in ramping up the immune system. Yeah. If you don't turn the T cells off, once an infection is cleared, you get uh, autoimmunity. Or if you have a transplant patient and you don't suppress the immune system, your T cells can go haywire and the T cells can start attacking the transplanted organ. So you need to be able to turn them off. Do they use prednisone for that? Prednisone is an immunosuppressant, yes. Yeah. I think I experienced a little bit of that. Uh -huh. So especially for transplant recipients, prednisone and another one is cyclosporin. Mm -hmm. Both of those are steroids that suppress the immune system. So people who are on those immunosuppressants, they often have to be careful of being in public spaces because different bacteria or viruses that are in the air that are harmless for you and me, for a person on immunosuppressants, it's very harmful. Yeah. You need to be able to turn these T cells off. Um, and one of the main ways that T cells are, get turned off is through this break. This break. This, the cells have a natural break. It's called, where is it? Down here, P1. So it's a break. It basically ramps down the immune response. Um, and in cancer, cancer exploits this breaking mechanism. So many types of cancer cells, tumors, they overexploit the breaking mechanism to evade the immune response. So they artificially, not artificially, but they overzealously uh, turn on the T cell break so that the T cell doesn't kill the cancer cell. And that's a big problem uh, in immunotherapy is this overuse of the breaking system by cancer. Does that make sense? That's an important point. Um, so one of the hot topics now in immunotherapy is to block the, the break, to get rid of the negative regulator. Break the break, basically. Um, and to do that, um, people have used these drugs, these antibodies, that block the interaction between the break and its, and its breaker, basically. So when two molecules, so when PD1, the break, interacts with its natural partner on a cancer cell, the breaking system is employed. If we can block that interaction from occurring, <coughs> you, you basically take your foot off the break, and the T cell's activation mechanism is accelerated. If the T cell activation mechanism is accelerated artificially by, by blocking that interaction, then you have a better chance of killing cancerous cells. And that's exactly what people have been seeing in the clinic. So by targeting PD-1, by administering a drug that acts against PD-1, anti-PD-1, you get much better uh, clinical results, especially in cancers of the immune system. So lymphoma, leukemias, it's also starting to work for solid tumors like pancreatic cancer, for example. So these are a couple of different drugs from the big pharma companies, Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck. And there's a race now uh, going on in the biotech pharma world to target all these different breaks that T cells have uh, that are exploited by cancer to turn off the immune response. Uh, so we're working on some of this right now. Who's the closest to it so I can buy this? <laughs> uh, actually, here. So these two are the closest. Bristol Myers uh, Squibb and Merck. They're both actually on the market, I think, right now. But now everybody's racing to get these drugs on the market. I'm going to have to edit that out. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, the truth is the truth.
Yeah, so if you take your foot off the brake, block that interaction with PD-1, you get a hyperactive immune response. They start killing cancer, and tumors shrink very reliably. I have a different question. Yeah. I noticed that the names of these medications are kind of, it's like someone chose random letters and put them together. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. I'm going to name it this way. How do they come up with these names? Do you have any That's idea? Good question. I don't know the rationale behind it. I think they try to make them as distinctive as possible so that people don't get confused between companies and things like that. But the only thing you can take out of it is, like, at the end of them, they say MAB. MAB that means is, monoclonal is, antibody. is constant. And MAB ah. stands for monoclonal antibody. So an antibody is a protein that's naturally produced by our immune system that also aids in defending against bacteria and viruses. Um, so the agent that blocks this breaking mechanism and keeps the T cells on is actually an antibody. This is an antibody right here. This little triangular thing with a, with a stem. Um, and this antibody, it binds to the break here, the PD-1 guy, and it, by binding to it, it prevents PD-1's interacting partner, PDL1, from interacting. So that breaking system is disengaged. So these uh, antibodies, they're, they're often referred to as MAPs, or monoclonal antibodies. Charles Rudin, Chief of the Thoracic Oncology Service at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. I specialize in the treatment of lung cancers. In this video, I'll provide an overview of immune checkpoint inhibitors, a form of immunotherapy for the treatment of lung cancer. The immune system has safety mechanisms that are designed to suppress the immune response when necessary. So that's the breaking mechanism. These mechanisms are called immune checkpoint pathways and minimize damage to healthy tissues when utilized at the appropriate time. When the immune system recognizes a healthy cell, it is suppressed. However, when the immune system recognizes foreign cells, it becomes activated and can destroy them. The challenge is that cancer cells are able to adapt these immune checkpoint pathways to avoid detection so it and lessen the immune system. response. This allows cancer cells to thrive. In order to combat these cancer cells, researchers are studying a therapy called immune checkpoint inhibitors. So let's review how immune checkpoint inhibitors work. As their name implies, Immune checkpoint inhibitors work by targeting the immune checkpoint pathway so of the, the immune system, the block the essentially system. the brakes on the system. Yeah. Their goal is to keep the immune system from suppressing itself so that the body's own anti-cancer response works better. Currently, drugs are being developed most actively against a few specific targets, PD-1 or PD-L1 and CTLA-4. With over 7,000 research slots designated for lung cancer patients, infusion time and schedules may vary depending on the drug. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are generally given intravenously over 30 to 90 minutes. They are generally given every two to four weeks until confirmed disease progression or until the clinical research study ends. So you guys get the idea, but just a summary of what I was explaining. Um, so that's called checkpoint therapy. You block the breaking system, you accelerate the T-cell response, tumors shrink. Another hot field in immunotherapy that I'll just discuss briefly is cancer vaccination. So vaccine is a word that's commonly thrown around in, in the press and in society as a whole. Uh, in simple terms, a vaccine can be defined by being a biological preparation that provides immune-based protection against a particular disease. So vaccines against smallpox, hepatitis B, 
they, uh, they really helped in eradicating those diseases, or not eradicating maybe, but reducing their incidence. Um, what a vaccine is, is basically you take part of a pathogen, part of a virus or a bacteria, for example. So if you take hepatitis C, which is a virus, you kind of inactivate it or make it less, less virulent, less, less dangerous for you, and inject it into a, a recipient, you'll actually launch a sort of mild immune response. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the immune response, it can retain memory to a virus or a bacteria or to cancer. The idea here is to help exploit that property of memory so that if a cancerous cell or a virus is encountered later on, it can be dealt with very quickly. So, in cancer vaccines, what they do is they'll take cancerous cells from a patient and they'll kind of neutralize them. They'll make them <coughs> non-proliferative so they can't divide. So you take away their sort of deadly edge away from them and you re-inject them into a host. And you will launch the host's, the person's own immune system against those cancerous cells. And in that way you can help either block disease progression, or in certain cases in which the person hasn't developed a tumor yet, actually prevent the onset of tumor formation. Um, and this final topic actually comes full circle of what you were asking about a while ago with the gene therapy. It's called adoptive T-cell therapy. So here, um, I can play this video. Basically what they're doing here is they develop a gene that recognizes little red flags on the surfaces of cancers. And this gene will target only those red flags and leave healthy tissue untouched. And in that way, you have a very targeted therapy for killing cancer cells. So you're basically engineering the cell. T cells are critical for removing harmful cells, such as cancer cells or infected cells <clears throat> from the body. T-cell receptors bind to foreign proteins expressed on harmful cells, which leads to killing of the harmful cell. Unfortunately, most of the time T-cells do not have a receptor that can bind to proteins on cancer cells. This allows most cancers to escape T-cell killing and proliferate. At Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, we're using cell engineering technology to target T-cells at cancer. We use vectors to modify a patient's T-cells to express a receptor that targets the T-cells so to proteins the on the patient's about. cancer Sorry, cells. These genetically targeted T-cells are then able to bind to and kill the patient's that's cancer the cells. Binding to the red flag. This technology serves as the foundation then, for our clinical trials kills the in leukemia cell. and prostate cancer. Yep. So, yeah, those are some new therapies that are going on. You, have, you eliminate the breaking system, that's called checkpoint therapy. You can vaccinate people against cancers, that's showing some promising leads in the clinic. And you have gene, uh, gene therapy, uh, immune engineering, essentially. You're engineering an artificial little gene that targets red flags on cancer cells, leaves the entire rest of your body untouched so you don't get autoimmunity, you don't get inflammation, person doesn't get horribly sick. Typically they, they exhibit um, flu-like symptoms, but that's pretty much it. So, What about shutting off the blood supply to tumors? I know they're yeah, that's actually another um, active area of research. So tumors, uh, especially solid tumors that lodge themselves in a tissue, they will often <coughs> redirect a person's blood vessels or, or, or they will cause new blood vessels to be directed to the tumor and those blood vessels will carry blood and oxygen and nutrients to the tumor and essentially feeding the tumor. That's called angiogenesis, the birth of new blood vessels basically that are exploited by cancer. People are trying to develop therapies again for shutting off the blood supply. I don't know how far they've gotten yet, but people are trying, yeah. Actually, when I was an undergrad, I worked in a lab that was trying to find out the best compound for blocking the uh, 
making of the new blood vessels that lead to tumors. So we got fairly far along, and I haven't kept in touch with that lab as frequently as I should. It's definitely a very active.